In this video, we're going to look at meiosis, the reduction division. In our last video, we took an in-depth look at mitosis, a different type of nuclear division. So the first question we have to ask is, why do we need a different process from mitosis? We'll take a, look, a close look at the stages of meiosis, and in doing so, we'll review some important terms, such as crossing over and independent assortment. And finally, we'll end with a quick comparison with mitosis. In sexually reproducing organisms, we have a fusion of gametes at fertilization to produce a zygote. So two parents give rise to one offspring. So the question is, where do these gametes, the sperm and egg, that we're going to use for sexual reproduction, where do they come from? By what process are they made? Now, the cell that gives rise to gametes is called a germ cell. And it's diploid, meaning it has two of every type of chromosome. In this case, we have four chromosomes and two pairs, two long ones and two short ones. So if we use mitosis and cell division, like we looked at in our last video, we'd, the result would be two cells that were also diploid. So let's look at what would happen if that were the case. What we'd have is a diploid sperm fertilizing a diploid egg. And if that happened, the resulting zygote would be tetraploid, or it'd have four of every type of chromosome. And our offspring would go from having, uh, would have eight chromosomes, whereas our parent cells or our parent organisms had four. So each generation would be doubling the number of chromosomes, and that's a problem. So it's not mitosis and cell division that gives rise to gametes, at least not in diploid organisms. So we need another process, meiosis, the reduction division. To kind of preview, meiosis is a process of nuclear division and cell division used by germ cells to produce gametes. It reduces the ploidy from diploid to haploid, cutting the chromosome number in half. It involves two rounds of division and produces four gametes. Let's take a closer look at these germ cells that we're going to use for meiosis. So a germ cell is diploid. It has two of every chromosome. And these chromosomes are in what we call homologous pairs. Homologous pairs of chromosomes are alike, but not identical. They're going to carry the same number and type of genes in the same sequence. However, they may carry different alleles. So if we look at this, we can see that in this locus right here, let me grab an arrow, at this locus right here, on this chromosome, we have a Q. On its homolog, at the same locus, we also have to have a Q but we could have different versions of that Q, or different alleles. In my drawing, we have um, two pairs of homologous chromosomes. In your cells, you'd have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, or, or 23 pairs of chromosomes for 46 total. Now, the way we've drawn this cell, we can recognize, hopefully from our earlier videos on the cell cycle mitosis, that we're in G1 of interphase. But to prepare for any nuclear and cellular division, during S of interphase, DNA replication will occur, bringing us to G2 of interphase in preparation for a nuclear division event. Now let's look at these chromosomes that are uh, drawn like this. This represents one duplicated chromosome. We can look at it like this. When we look at a duplicated chromosome, the duplicated chromosomes are made through a process called DNA replication and I have another video on DNA replication that you can watch to see how replicating DNA makes exact copies. So this one chromosome, we consider this one thing while it's attached, this one duplicated chromosome is made of two sister chromatids and the two sister chromatids are identical to each other because they're made through a semi-conservative DNA replication process. So what we have in our cell now are pairs of homologous chromosomes. This is one chromosome here, and this is one chromosome here. They're duplicated, and they're homologous. Each chromatid of the sister pair are identical, but again, our homologs are just alike. Now, while we go through this process of meiosis, I want to track where these chromosomes are going. So instead of having them all blue, I'm going to go ahead and color them like I have these models down here and make them yellow and red so it makes it easier for us to track these as we go through the process. So now we'll begin our steps of meiosis. We're in G2 of interphase, which is prior to meiosis, and we move into prophase 1. We say prophase 1 because it's going to take two rounds of division to complete meiosis. 
Now during prophase 1, we have some of the same events, or many of the same events, that we had in prophase of mitosis. Our chromosomes are going to shorten and thicken, our nuclear envelope begins to break down, and the spindle fibers begin to form. But there's one major difference between prophase 1 and prophase of mitosis. In fact, it's the singular most important event that differentiates meiosis from mitosis. And that is that during prophase 1, homologous chromosomes are going to link up and form what we call a tetrad. So these two long chromosomes, they're both in the duplicated state, come together and join to make a tetrad. And I'm going to show you with the models down here what that would look like. So now we have a tetrad. And a tetrad, tetra means four, is composed of four chromatids. So at this point, this is considered one thing, one tetrad. So we have one long tetrad and one short tetrad. And this tetrad formation, like I said, is the singular most important difference uh, between meiosis and mitosis. And tetrad formation occurs during prophase one. Now let's take a closer look at one of these tetrads and see another unique event that happens during meiosis. So here I've zoomed in on uh, one of the tetrads. I made those long chromosomes even bigger so we can see them up close. And I want to talk about an event called crossing over that can often occur during meiosis. So while we have these tetrads here, it's not uncommon for these end pieces of them to get kind of twisted up. And when they do, sometimes part of them can break. And when they break, they can reattach. Whoops, and if I can grab it. When they reattach, sometimes they can reattach to a non-sister chromatid. So if you can see what I did there, that's called crossing over. It's an exchange of parts between non-sister chromatids. I can show you the same thing over here in these models. It would be as if these two parts uh, exchanged like that. Now, we don't consider crossing over a mutation. Um, we didn't lose any genes. We didn't gain any genes. We didn't alter an E into some other letter. But what we did do is shuffle the deck a little bit. It is a source of genetic diversity that results from meiosis. Um, before, any time we had a lowercase d, it was linked to a lowercase e. But now, in one of these chromatids, we have a sequence that didn't exist before. We have a little d with a big e. And so, uh, you can see that this creates some diversity in the uh, combinations you might have in a chromatid. And that's an important concept. And crossing over can happen anytime you have your tetrad combined like this. So anytime during prophase one after the tetrad is formed, and anytime during metaphase one before the tetrads have split apart. All right, so we're back to prophase one. Let's move from prophase one to anaphase one. I'm sorry, metaphase one. In metaphase, the tet of uh, metaphase one of meiosis, the tetrads line up on the equator. Now, one of the interesting things that can happen here. Now one of the things we can see here during metaphase one is that I, the way I've drawn this, the yellow long one is on the right and the red long one is on the left, but on the bottom I did opposite. But this is completely random. We call this idea independent assortment. In other words, I could have just as easily put the uh, put them like this and rearrange that. All right. So what happens and how these this tetrad lines up is an independent event in terms of the alignment of this tetrad. So I'm going to go ahead and put them back this way just to uh, show what could happen. But this alignment, and imagine in your cells there are going to be 23 of these tetrads that could all line up, you know, red, yellow, yellow, red, in different sequences. And each time we go through this process, that pattern could be different. And so it leads to an idea that we're going to talk about in genetics of independent assortment, that the genes on these chromosomes up here assort independently from genes on chromosomes down here. So as we move from metaphase 1 to anaphase 1, this idea of independent assortment stays with us. And in anaphase 1, the tetrads pull apart. Notice that sister chromatids are still together. So tetrads are pulling apart, moving to opposite poles of the cell. And from anaphase 1, we can move to telophase 1. We're starting to build new sets of DNA around our chromosomes. Um, and you can see that at this point, we have reduced the chromosome number. Our original cell had four chromosomes, but in this new nucleus, we're going to have two chromosomes, one long one and one short one. Now, 
they are in the duplicated state, but this is considered one thing. So we've already reduced our chromosome number from 4 to 2, and we only have one of each type, one long one, one long duplicated chromosome, and one short one. So after telophase 1, we have cytokinesis, where we divide this into two cells that we can call primary gametes. By the end of meiosis 1, we've gone from one cell to two, we've cut the chromosome number in half, we've reduced the ploidy from diploid to haploid. However, our chromosomes are still duplicated, so we're going to need another round of division. So we head into meiosis 2. So in prophase of meiosis 2, uh, and the second round of meiosis looks very similar to mitosis, except that all of our chromosomes are haploid instead of diploid. So our, all of our cells are haploid rather than diploid. So our chromosomes that are still in the duplicated state shorten and thicken, the nuclear envelope breaks down, spindle fibers begin to form. From prophase 2, we go to metaphase 2, where our duplicated chromosomes line up on the cell's equator. From metaphase 2 to anaphase 2, and finally, we separate our sister chromatids from each other. From anaphase 2, we move to telophase 2, where we divide up these uh, chromosomes into their own uh, nuclei. We start to build a nuclear envelope around each set of DNA. And you can see cytokinesis beginning to happen. And you can kind of see what's, what's in the future as we move from telophase 2 uh, into the last cytokinesis event where we form four distinct cells, each of them having half the number of chromosomes that we started with from four to two, and each of them being haploid rather than diploid, one of each type of chromosome. Now to recap and overview, I have one diploid germ cell that during S of interphase uh, replicates its DNA, and then we enter meiosis. In meiosis one, we reduce our chromosome number by half, and we reduce our ploidy from diploid two of every type to haploid, one of every type. But with these chromosomes in duplicated state, we need another round of division, or meiosis II, to form our four haploid gametes. Now we can use these haploid cells during sexual reproduction so that a haploid egg is fertilized by haploid sperm to produce a diploid zygote and restore our chromosome number for the next generation. To do a quick compare and contrast between meiosis and mitosis. In both cases, we're starting with a diploid cell. In meiosis, it's called a germ cell. In mitosis, it's somatic or body cell. DNA will replicate in both cases. And we can see that we have one round of division to divide those duplicated chromosomes up. And in mitosis, we get back what we started. In other words, diploid cells to diploid cells. But in meiosis, we have our reduction division during meiosis one where we reduce our chromosome number, and then we have our second division to pull our duplicated chromosomes apart, resulting in four haploid gametes. And that does it for meiosis. So go back through, uh, go slowly, pause, back it up, draw your own pictures so you have good pictures to look at when you study. Make sure you dig in detail what happens at each step, and also be able to recognize different pictures, uh, identify them as which stage of mitosis or meiosis that they would be in. And make sure to go back and review the cell cycle and mitosis videos that we posted earlier.